So hello and welcome to the APH Connect Center Vision Aware webinar, Vision Loss, It's a Family Matter. We have several families with us today. Our special guest is Sylvia Perez. I will have my cohort, Pris Rogers, tell you a little bit more about that. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We will be collecting questions for uh, a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. Pris, you can go ahead and take it away. All right, great, Melanie. And welcome everybody. We're glad to have you here today. This is gonna be exciting to have such a great group. Uh, it makes me very happy to be able to introduce to you Sylvia Stinson Perez, who right now is the director of the OIB Tech Technical Assistance Program, which is for older blind at Mississippi State University. Uh, and she also directs the Vision Specialist Graduate uh, Program there as well. Um, she has over 20 years of experience in our field of vision rehab and has the uh, background to uh, hold that up. She has master's degrees in social work and visual disabilities education and business administration. And she's also a certified vision rehabilitation therapist. So she has a wonderful background. And she also served as the executive director of the Lighthouse for the Visually Impaired in Port Ritchie, Florida, uh, where they provided a whole range of vision education and rehab and employment services for people of all ages that's experiencing vision loss or blindness. So as you can see, Sylvia comes to us with a wonderful background in our field and the, just delighted to have her. Sylvia, take it away. Thank you, Pris. One day, Maybe the field will talk talk about me like we talk about Pris, you know, one of those icons. I can only hope. <laughs> Thank you, Pris. It is fantastic to be with everyone today. I feel really passionate about our subject today. Vision loss is a family matter. Now, as some of you who know me will know is I am visually impaired, well, practically blind at this point. I grew up with a visual impairment. There's a lot that is said, that is taught, that is provided for people who are visually impaired. But what about the whole sector of the family, the loved ones, the people who surround those of us who are visually impaired, who are also impacted? When someone's initially diagnosed with a visual impairment or maybe they've been living with it forever like me and a couple others who are gonna uh, be on, you know, we, we know that we lose our ability to get around. Maybe we have transportation challenges. Maybe initially someone can't do their own medications. Life can really change. But do we ever really consider how it also changes and how the loved one is impacted. They may become the caretaker, the driver, the person who organizes those medications, the cook. And so today's conversation is really important because what we want to do is talk with some people who've been there, those loved ones who've been there. And our real goal is to really figure out what can the loved one do to support independence and self-advocacy, which will dramatically not only improve the life of the person who's visually impaired, but also their own life. And so today we have, we have four guests, but three who are the loved ones. So we are gonna kick off by asking each of them to introduce themselves and, and I'm gonna call on them and they're going to just share really briefly their story. So Curtis and Cheryl, Curtis, take it away. Hey, thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, Cheryl and I are happy to be here today and, and glad that y'all could join us. Um, my, I met my wife, uh, Cheryl, in, uh, when we were both in college at uh, Southwest Missouri State some 31 years ago. Um, her father had already been diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, which is a hereditary degenerative retinal disease. So when I met her, um, she was already aware that eventually her vision would deteriorate and potentially be lost completely. So, um, and, and uh, fortunately, my love for her was stronger than any fear at that point. So, um, 
uh, moving forward through the 31 years, she's continued to gradually lose her vision to the point where she really only has about basic light perception uh, today. But um, she's a mobility cane to get around and also um, uh, magnification, uh, but less and less to that extent these days because it's gotten to the point where she uses more uh, screen reading software and technology to help her uh, do her job. As you can see here, she's sitting in her office while I'm working from home. So that's kind of an inverted uh, <laughs> typical situation, but I uh, wouldn't trade our life for anything. We've had a, a great 31 years and I look forward to sharing more today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Curtis and Cheryl, for being here with us. Thank Tammy, you. would you share your story real briefly? Introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you, Sylvia. So my name is Tammy Roussel, and I live with my husband, Mark, and our two mothers, who are both 95 years old here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, my mom was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa as well, and um, we didn't really know that she would eventually lose all of her sight. The doctor had mentioned that um, that was a possibility, but I think I was very optimistic that that wouldn't happen. Um, she is now, as I mentioned, 95. She was diagnosed, you know, in her probably early 60s. Uh, so we, we take every day and, and enjoy it. And it's been quite the, quite the um, experience. <laughs> Wow, so you have two people you're caring for. Wow, awesome. Yes, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's a very challenge. blended family. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us. Shayla. Hi there, Sylvia. <laughs> what can I say? You know my story, but I guess everybody else doesn't. Um, John and I have been married for 27 years. Uh, he's a retired major. When I first met him, he was partially paralyzed on his left side from being hit out of a helicopter from Vietnam. So I knew there was an issue there with his left side. Got that. I understand that. Never in the world did we ever think that he was going to lose his eyesight. Never heard him. He has macular degeneration. So his right eye is completely blind. His left eye, he has a little bit of peripheral vision. And the thing is, is we never ever expected that to happen, never. And had no idea how to, what to do. We didn't know any blind people. We didn't know any resources were out there. And then somebody told us about the lighthouse. And so- We'll, we'll come back to that. So okay. thank you for that introduction. <laughs> okay, thanks. <sir. laughs> we'll get to all of that. Okay. And so our next question is, how did you, as the loved ones, feel initially? You know, oftentimes we talk about the emotional feelings that someone who is visually impaired go through. And it's like the grief process. You, you're, you know, immediately shock, denial. Okay, if I just get the right pair of glasses, all things will be fine. Um, I can't believe this is happening to me. Kind of like Shayla said, I don't know anybody who's blind. I can't do anything, that depression. But what about you as the loved ones? And let's start with you, Tammy. How did you feel? Yeah, well, as I mentioned at first, it was the denial. It was, um, oh, mom's so independent. She'll have no problem. She'll be fine, you know, thinking that it was just maybe impact her a little and we, you know, we would just manage it. Uh, but over time, as her eyesight progressively got worse, it was clear that that wasn't the case. And, and then it turned into fear. You know, I was very fearful. I wasn't living close by and, and we only, I only have one other sibling and neither was he. And so the fear was, am I gonna, you know, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna help her? And so I realized, you know, I don't know if this is being sexist, but as the girl that I probably would be the one to help mom and that I would probably have to move back, you know, move back to where she was living. So, so it, was, it was definitely that experience of denial, fear. I never really got angry. I mean, how can you get angry, right? I and mean, it's certainly not her fault. And, uh, but, but it, it was difficult. It was a difficult transition. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you for being so honest about that. Shayla, how did you feel? I guess I was shocked. Um, you know, number one is the first thing I thought of. Let's take him to every doctor. There's got to be a doctor out there that can help him. It doesn't go that, your eyesight can't go that quick, although it did. But I just couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. So, of course, we took him from one doctor to another and getting the same answer from all of them. You know, they could stop the bleeding behind the eye so he wouldn't go completely blind, but he would never get any more eyesight back. So, it was it took us a while to get used to that. So, you know, but we've managed, you know, so okay. takes, it takes time. Uh, yeah, it does. And you know what? And I think that's an important thing. And when we talk about this grief process and the, the loss of vision, very rarely is it that someone wakes up and they can't see. That does happen. Yeah. But generally, it's a process where you have a little bit of vision loss, you get used to that amount. And I think you even as the loved one, I hear you saying, okay, we got used to that amount. But then something else happens and more vision is lost. And then now we have to get used to that level of vision. So it's a process. Curtis, what about you and Cheryl? How did you feel? I and mean, you talked a little bit about it, but over time, you know, were there moments where you felt uh, frustration or anger or loss or, or any of those feelings? Yeah, I'll, I'll say something real quick and then let Cheryl chime in. So we certainly thought we had a long, pretty long runway uh, based on her father's experience. He didn't uh, get diagnosed and really have an issue until he was in his 40s. So we thought we had a good half of our life to live, you know, before uh, it affected us. But what we didn't factor in was the effect of two childbirths on her body that her father never experienced. And that affected her vision uh, more significantly. So it got on us a little earlier than we expected. And after 10 years of marriage, uh, she wasn't able to drive anymore. And we had two children to raise. So it was a bit of a shock. I don't know if you want to add something to that, Cheryl. You know, I think it was important You know, those were a tough 10 years. I, I lost at first little independences and then bigger independences and lost the ability to cook. I felt like I couldn't take care of my family. I lost the sense of, I lost the ability to manage our finances. And so I kept losing these independences, but each time that I would lose something, Curtis and our family would surround me and we'd figure out another way to make it happen. Uh, eventually I found Alpha Point where I learned all the skills of blindness training. Um, and I, it, I truly, we got through it um, because of real communication. We kept talking to each other and um, they would let me have moments of, I call them my 10 minute pity parties. And then they'd lift me up and go, come on, we gotta go. And it was, it's definitely a family matter. Yeah. Thank you so much. And you know, you, you said something really that I used to, when I was doing groups teaching and doing support groups that I always talked about, and I would give people 15 minutes. So I gave a little more than that, 10. <laughs> you can have a 15 minute pity party every day. And I think that applies to the loved one too, because you have those losses as well, but you need to acknowledge those losses because it's hard. It's hard for everyone. And yeah. you actually started to answer one of my next questions is, how long did it take you to get help and what kind of help did you get? So Curtis and Cheryl, if you guys want to go ahead and, and maybe answer that real quick and then I'll move yeah. on. Cheryl's got a, a quick story on that. I'll let her okay. continue. Um, you know, so mine was progressive and it was over many years. And so after college, that next 10 years, I really experienced a lot of loss. Um, in two, year 2000, that 10th year, I quit working. And then I went home and over the next 14 years, I lost big independences. Um, I was very active in the community, active with the family, you know, surrounded by friends, but that didn't stop the isolation from setting in. And I won't go into all those details, but I'll tell you in uh, 2014 is when I made that tough phone call to say I needed help. I found low vision rehabilitation. Um, so I would say it took me about 
14, no, about 10 years before I finally really made that phone call. And I wish I'd made it sooner. Curtis, you want to add anything to that? I think you covered it. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Um, I mean, and, and, and that we hear that often is that mm -hmm. people never are all frequently they don't know that help is available and then just taking that step is often so hard shayla you want to share yours and john's story about reaching out for help which i am thrilled to have been a part of yes you were <laughs> well obviously like i said it was a shock when john lost his eyesight and we went to all of the, the doctors everything realized that there was no help somebody had told us about the lighthouse so I approached John. Well, at that time, he was just mad at the world. He was mad at me, God, everything. You know, he was just angry, you know. So, and he refused to go to the lighthouse. So finally, he get, he would sit around here moping and groaning and depressed. And I felt so bad for him. And finally, one day I said, go for a ride for me. Let's go up to Windex and get some groceries. So he was, oh, all right, I'll go. And it's like 110 degrees. We live in Florida. You know how that goes. So what I did is I drove straight to the lighthouse and it was 110 degrees and that's hotter in half. And I got out of the car. I said, John, go into here. Let's get some information. If they can help you, I'll never ask you again. But one time, let's go in and hear what they have to say. I'm not going in there. I said, fine, I've got the keys. You can't go anywhere. I'm going in and talk to these people. So I went in. So then I think the gal's name there was Dawn were Sylvia's helper. So I went in there and I saw me peeking out the window. I said, I'm if, if my husband's going to come in, you know, and I told her what was going on. She goes, oh, we've heard that story before. He'll come in. Sure enough, here comes John wobbling. And the first thing he says is, you people can't help me. There ain't no way you guys can help me. You don't know what it's like to go blind. And the woman goes, I am blind. <laughs> you know, I think I know what it's like to go blind. And John just stood there and just shut up. And so then the more she talked, and we met Sylvia, which they told us about all the classes, all the things, all the simple things that John had lost. It's stupid little things that we never even thought about. Like, I know this sounds silly to you guys, but putting toothpaste on a toothbrush, you know? I mean, here, John, every day, we, he, it, the toothpaste is all over the bathroom, you know? And they said, hey, it's going in your mouth. Just put it in your mouth and use your toothbrush. Duh, common sense. There were so many common sense things that the lighthouse and Sylvia's classes taught John so he wasn't so angry. Plus he was around people that were going through the same thing he was going through or had gone through, which helped tremendously. Like I said, they taught him a lot, a lot of silly little things that we didn't think of. And then the classes taught him even better, you know? So then we didn't know anything about Zoom text. We didn't know, we didn't know any of that kind of stuff. And he was too proud to ask, and I was too mad that day. I said, you know what? I had enough. He's sitting around. He's a major, retired major, for God's sakes. And he's sitting around here moaning and groaning, not doing anything, not even trying. So, and then he met Sylvia, fell in love with her, by the way. So, I mean, <laughs> she helped him. The one thing that John loved to do was cook. And she goes, well, you can still cook. And he's going, I can't cook. I can't see. Well, he could see contrast. She he he took her cooking lesson and I'll be done. John's back to cooking, just like that. I mean, it's not easy. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. But he can do it, and it's the things that he enjoyed doing, and that's because of Sylvia and her lighthouse. Honestly, that thing. And then they set us up with the VA, which helped him even better because he was a computer nut before. He used to get on the computer and read the newspapers every day. Well, all of a sudden he can't. They sent him up with a, a thing so that they can read it, they can talk to you. He can pick out the article and he can hear it. So he can still keep up with the world, which was what he was feeling so bad, you know, about stuff. All right, I'll shut up, I know. Shayla, I, I that, was, that was wonderful though, I, Shayla, because I think you talked about so many things that, that, that are the frustrations that people feel. And you know what? We could hear the frustration in your voice and many people, who are the loved ones, they feel those frustrations. They don't know what to do. And I think you no. just expressed that so well. 
because all you do, you feel so, I felt so sorry for mm -hmm. him, you mm -hmm. know, and here, instead of me having him do it, I found myself doing everything for him, right. doing all the things. So that, that leads me, Shayla, you know, to my next question. And that is, what did you do to support independence and self-advocacy? And I think that we've heard you made him go and get some services. And then you sat back and even when you were scared, you let him cook or you, you I watched encouraged him, and him I, to cook. I had the peroxide and the band-aids up on the counter. <laughs> I mean, I had them all sitting up there because I knew we were going to use them. But I also know that he loved to cook and it was something yeah. he could do. I watched him. I went yeah. to one of the classes yeah. and sat there. I watched him and the other people prepare them. So I knew he could do it all of a sudden. It was right. like So you, you things supported like that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And he so, we, I remember, if you remember, Sylvia, he, you invited me to come to one of the mm -hmm. dinners. Or the luncheons that you guys made, and John yeah. goes, "Oh no, no, you don't have to." I said, "I want to see what you're doing," you know, because I want to see what he could do and what he couldn't, because and, I was so sorry for him. And you know? that's important if any of loved ones get the opportunity, because you are scared oftentimes, and you don't yeah. know when someone says, "Oh, I can cook." You're imagining as a person who cited, "I don't see how you could do that." No. Or if they want to take the bus on their own or take an Uber, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm really nervous about that. So take that opportunity and be a part of that training. Tammy, what did you do to support independence for, for your mom? And I know one of those big things, Tammy. <laughs> yes, well, um, I'll kind of meld the two questions together of when we finally got help. Unfortunately, it was... It was um, in, at the point where I realized my mom was at risk before I got her help, because I didn't really know where to turn and I didn't even know if she needed help. I wasn't living close by. So um, one day I was visiting her and I brought her for a drive. And when we got back to her house, she got out of the car and she proceeded to walk into the street instead of to the house. And at that point I knew it was like, wow, you know, I, I really can't leave her alone like this. And so I had moved, I made arrangements to move back and no one ever told us there was help. You know, that's one thing I'd really like to focus on today is, is I think there needs to be more general awareness that the earlier you can get people help before they lose their eyesight, that that is to such tremendous advantage. And we didn't do that. We, we waited way too long. I think uh, you're right on that, Cammie. Definitely uh, right but on when we finally we, um, you know, we got the help around the house to, to help her understand, you know, how to navigate a little bit better. I got tools that um, helped her to realize when she was, you know, pouring water into her cup. I mean, she'd already, um, you know, lost a lot of independence. So I tried to give her the tools that they taught me uh, to help her to be more independent. We didn't take like we tried to help her live alone for as long as we could. Um, I moved closer to her so that, you know, I could, I could check up on her. And then it was over time as she continually lost her um, vision that we started thinking about her moving in with us. But it really wasn't even just that. Unfortunately, my mom also developed dementia, which as a blind person, that's catastrophic because you can't rely on your memory. And so that was the tough combination. But the biggest thing I think Sylvia alluded to was um, that was huge for us. My mom became very depressed because she was losing all of her independence and she used to be a seamstress. So um, I, I just thank God that he put on my, my heart and my head to help her to sew. And I was able to invent a way to help her to sew by touch. And so now she still, she sews quilts for all of our grandchildren and, and it has turned into something we do for a lot of people who are blind, visually impaired and, and other disabilities. Thank you, Tammy. And for those who don't know, Tammy is the, the founder of Mitzi Kits. So, and I'm sure lots of people have heard about that and will want to look it up. And so Tammy, you kind of answered one of one of my next questions is the most challenging time. So so Curtis, do you have anything, you know, going back with that other question about getting help? And I think we we kind of heard your story. What was 
was a really challenging time, Curtis, that you guys went through. That, and I'm going to leave it to you, Curtis, that you personally experienced with Cheryl's vision loss. Yeah, there were actually two that, that are pretty distinct to me. One is when um, she was the breadwinner um, shortly after we got married. She was uh, in the mortgage business and doing very well and uh, built our new house. And shortly after we moved in, she couldn't read the paperwork anymore. And back then they didn't have a lot of the technical uh, capabilities that they do uh, today, especially in the mortgage industry for the original paperwork and so forth. So uh, all of a sudden I had to become, you know, the breadwinner <laughs> and uh, we had a nice new house that we had to make mortgage payments on um, as well as get the kids going and all that. Um, she did very well with the kids and raising our family. She was a rock star, no doubt about it. Um, but the other challenging time I think was when the kids grew up and went off to college and there was nobody coming through the door at 3 PM anymore. And, um, and I wouldn't come home till 5.30 or 6 from work. And she went to a pretty dark place. And it was very hard for me to try and relate and cope, even after so much time of dealing with that um, already in our lives. It, it, it was a whole new level that I didn't get. So, you know, what was key was communication and um, talking through it a lot and trying to understand what, what her challenges were and what she couldn't see and what that was doing to her emotionally. Um, and then just to reiterate again, what everybody has said, I think, um, you know, the, er, if we would have gone to Apple point earlier, I think we could have avoided a lot of that. If we had known about Apple point earlier, we could, we, and unfortunately Cheryl's main role at Alpha point now is getting the word out about Alpha point to other people. So hopefully that won't continue as much. Made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That empty nest is hard. I have one. It's very sad. <laughs> um, what, tell us um, one resource that you really wished you had known about. And so we, I think all of you've kind of mentioned the rehabilitation training. So is there another resource that all of you wish you had really known about? Even if it, it maybe it's something that doesn't exist. So um, Curtis and Cheryl, is there any resource that would have made a world of difference if you had known about it sooner? Um, that's a tough one because honestly, for me, just knowing that low vision rehabilitation existed, mm -hmm. that it was a thing. And now that I'm at Alpha Point, I'm in, and I'm, I was a client, now an employee. Um, my whole mission on top of Alpha Point's mission is to get the word out to as many people as possible, as early as possible to tell them, you know, there is help out there for you. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to go through the struggle if you just make that simple phone call. Mm -hmm. It's never too early to call mm -hmm. and ask for help. Right, great. I and think, she, um, she, oh, I, I just wanna highlight something that actually Shayla said um, that I think we've witnessed, but um, neither one of us are veterans, but Cheryl's dad's a veteran and the VA has a, a large uh, toolkit of ways to help um, veterans who have vision impairment. Um, his, his computer story is similar to what Shayla said about her husband and that um, his, his world was closed and dark with no friendships really developed um, and being able to get on the computer and get go to the Heinz Center in Chicago and get mm -hmm. training on uh, technology allowed him to open his whole world back up and now he's got friends all over the world. Uh, talk and, has probably yes. with them every morning. So, and, and I know that Shayla would say the VA, the Veterans Administration, and the wonderful thing for everyone to know is that uh, services, re vision rehabilitation, and low vision services from the VA are not service connected. Anyone who's visually impaired, who's been a veteran, can access those services, and it is a tremendous right. service. <laughs> Tammy, Tammy, is there one thing that occurs to you, one resource you wish you had known about? Um, well, I think it's any of the vision rehabilitation mm -hmm. services. You know, I, I talked briefly about the, the sewing that my mom helped bring her out of her depression. But, you know, in general, the ACB has their crafting group and other groups that people participate in. And that might not seem important, but I'm, I, you know what? 
having something that you can feel good about, that's relaxing, that you're producing something and creating, those are real, those are real life changing skills. And I think that any of these um, vision rehabilitation groups and programs are essential. And, and again, you know, so for instance, with crafting, if you learn before you lose your eyesight, then when you do lose more of your eyesight, it's so much easier. You know, it's easier to adapt. So I, I just, I think that's crucial, getting the word out. Yeah, absolutely. And so Tammy mentioned the ACB Crafters Group. So that's the American Council of the Blind and connection with consumer groups, the American Council of the Blind, the National Federation of the Blind, National Organization of Albinism and Hyperpigmentation, the Blinded Veterans Association, all of those where people can connect with people who understand their story. And not just the individual who's visually impaired, but the loved ones too. I know I've been at some of those conventions and I think that there's, it's equally as powerful for the loved ones because they're connecting with other people who they share a similar story. They, they share the same frustrations. That peer connection, I keep hearing all of you say it, is being able to connect with someone who understands. Really, really important. So I'm gonna wrap up the questions with one final question for each of you, and then we're gonna move to the question and answer portion with everyone. And my final question is, what is one success story that you can share about your journey and this could be your story about how you supported and encouraged independence and self-advocacy or your loved one who's visually impaired, impaired success. But I'd love to hear, you know, something that really is a success that you had while you were supporting independence and self-advocacy. And I'm going to start with you, Tammy. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I already spoke to the, the one thing that brought my mom the most joy and that was giving her her sewing back so um it was just anything that you can give someone that they used to love and they can continue to do is just you know it, it made such a difference in her quality of life and and you know I, I i just thank god because if it wasn't for that i believe her dementia would have progressed much faster as well Thank you. Um, my sister, um, when my parents passed away a couple of years ago, they, they both had some issues with dementia. And my sister said something profound. She said, everyone needs hobbies. And she told all of us, her siblings, she's, there's five of us, she's like, and, and our spouses, she's like, we have to get hobbies. And now all of us have so many hobbies that honestly work gets in our way. <laughs> hobbies are really important because it does help you relax. It helps you cope. Um, and, and, and I learned how to crochet blind. It would have been a lot easier if I had had a clue before. I could. Uh, Shayla, one amazing success story. I think uh, something that you're talking about for me and John together, or for I, I will tell something you this. about the vision oh, loss journey. Okay, that's okay. a success story. Mm -hmm. All right. And let me just tell you, um, one of the things that he lost when he lost his vision is we used to golf together all the time. We had membership. We golfed together all the time. Well, then he lost his eyesight. So he hung his clubs up. Well, then when I realized after he'd gone to this lighthouse and all the stuff, he could see contrast. Well, then I would take him out on the golf course and I would put the ball down and I'd say, okay, you can see the sand over there. Aim your ball to the sand. He would hit that ball and he was parring every hole. I said, you never played such better golf, you know, until you lost your vision. You know, all you do, aim at the white sand over there, John. Hey, you got it. Aim at my feet. I get up on the green there and I say, okay, you see my white tennis shoes? Aim the ball, put the ball toward my... So we went back to Gotham, which is something we had not done in over a year and a half. So it was, it, that was a success thing for us that we got back into doing things that we like to do together as a couple, you know? That's so, I mean, awesome. I guess, you know, it was awesome. It, you know, I mean, it made them laugh again. It got us out in the fresh air because I'm an outdoors person. I like being outside. So does he. So it was good again, instead of him sitting in the chair being depressed. 
you know. Mm -hmm. And I tell That's you another a, thing, you have to have patience and a sense of humor. Lord knows you have to have a sense of humor when you're dealing with somebody that's going blind because, you know, when they walk in the wall, you're going, oh my God, you're hurt. And then the next thing you know, I'm laughing. I'm going, no, oh, he's not hurt. <laughs> he just didn't even walk, walked in the wall. You think it's, it's not funny, but it is funny when, unless he gets hurt, you know, I mean, a silly little things like that. You got to have a sense of humor going, and she's going, you think that's funny? And I'm going, nope, I don't think that's funny. Then why are you laughing? I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> you know, truly, because I, I, because I, you know, you just don't know how to handle it and what to do. You, yeah. but you've got to have a sense of humor and things, like, because he knocks things over all the time because he doesn't see them. So we got glasses with tops on. Big deal. Like I told him, he says, "Why feel like a little kid?" I said, "So what? Who's going to see you but me? I don't care." You know, we pick it up, we go on. It's not a big deal. You just pick it up and go on. So. It's Thank just silly sure. things like that, but no, but the that's really big good. Us, so that's good. And Curtis and Cheryl. I think uh, you know our, our children are probably the biggest biggest success story. Um, they're both happy and healthy and uh, starting families of their own and and doing very well. I think um, uh, you know pretty normal. They've got a great sense of humor about their mom's vision loss, and we've always kind of kept that front and center. To Shayla's point. Um, you know, I've seen Cheryl snow ski, water ski, climb Chichen Itza. You know, there's nothing that she can't do. And I knew that when I met her before she lost her vision, that she could do anything she put her mind to. And, she, and you know, along with the assistance she's gotten, she's just proven that, um, you know, it's just they can do it. Visually impaired people can do anything normal people can do. Just they have to find a little different way to do it, you know. And yes. sometimes that takes assistance. Sometimes it just takes finding the right tool. So, right. I love, I love that. And so I love this concept of interdependence. We're always talking about independence, but how many people in this whole world are 100% independence? Nobody. We depend on uh, the grocery store to, to, you know, order our foods from the farms to get it and interdependence. So we all need each other. And when we can figure out what we can do, and how we can assist other people that depend on us. But so important is that building that, that interdependence and that as much independence and self dignity, self respect by allowing someone to have that self advocacy, really important that they can, that they can ask for what they need when they need it. So I think we're ready for our question and answer session, Chris and Melanie. I want to thank, um, Curtis and Cheryl and Tammy and Shayla, because I think you guys have done an excellent job of really sharing what the loved one experiences in the vision loss journey. But get ready, because now here comes some questions. I asked, I asked the easy ones, here comes the hard ones. <laughs> well, we don't have anything in the chat just yet as far as questions. We have gotten a couple of comments that um, people are just happy that uh, you guys are so honest about everything, that it, that's uh, one comment. And what a sparkly group here, I see. Love these stories, thanks for sharing. Um, I'm curious how other agencies are providing services during COVID restrictions. And so um, I don't know if, uh, Sylvia, if you have any ideas around that? Yeah, so so as part of the Older Blind Technical Assistance Center, we actually interact with all the 56 states and territories in the country. And it varies. There are some that are starting to provide some in-person services, but almost all have provided at least some level of services, um, whether that be a check-in by phone, some have provided online computer-based um, training and services. Um, others have literally gone to the person's house and dropped off stuff and then called them on the phone to provide training on whatever device it was. Maybe it was a talking clock or something. So uh, most places are doing their very best. An interesting thing to me is 
the consumer groups, ACB, NFB, really stepped up to do so much during this time. Um, American Printing House for the Blind, Hadley, you know, Hadley is already virtual, but um, APH, so many things are now offered virtually that I mean, you could literally spend all day taking a class on something as a person who's visually impaired. And I'm hoping that, that when COVID ends and we go back to being able to provide in-person training and services that all of these great things don't disappear because transportation is still a challenge. And this has just been a really good thing for people to get some um, services, but some of the more detailed things like orientation and mobility, there are some things that have been harder and people have not gotten services. And it varies from every single region because, you know, every place is different. I hope no, that I, answered. Um, someone has asked if you can tell us what Lighthouse is. Yeah, it just goes back. Can you on that a little bit? And then yeah. also. So across, across the country, every state agency provides services. So vocational rehabilitation services and older blind services. And those services, um, you can actually go to the Connect Center, APH Connect Center, or oib-tac.org. And we're actually about to launch a big public service campaign called Time to be Bold. Look for the commercials in the next month. But for finding services. So state agencies provide funding to private agencies as well. So some state agencies provide the services directly and some contract out the services. So a lighthouse, there's lighthouses for the visually impaired and blind or lighthouse for the blind. It's all, all kinds of names because they're not fiscally connected but they share that same name in a lot of places. And Curtis and Cheryl referred to Alpha Point which is another private agency and they have um, facilities in a few different states and I can't recall Kansas. If if I can, the yeah. uh, so Alpha Point is located in Kansas City, and we serve Kansas, uh, Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas. Um, we also have an agency in New York, right. uh, in Queens, New York, uh, where we provide low vision rehabilitation services across all the spectrum of skills of blindness, orientation, mobility, assistive technology, Braille, activities of daily living. And we serve youth from age two all the way through seniors, 100 or two. Um, so we develop right. programs for each of the, you know, different, for each person that walks through the door. And there's different agencies and you, in the country. You can find those services all over the country. Yes. Some provide less, some provide more. You know, it, it, it just varies from area to area. And you can go on, as I said, APH Connect or the oib-tac.org site to find services in your area. What I would like to mention too about the Lighthouse, and I don't know about yours, Cheryl, but the Lighthouse, number one, it was free. The classes were free, which totally surprised me. We were willing to pay for them, but they were free. And then the other thing- Well, you can send me a check to I've been sending you a check, girl. <laughs> I've been donating to you, but anyway, but the point is, is that you know, another thing was, which was a very yes. pleasant surprise was because the lighthouse uh, provided transportation for John to go back and forth. I was more than willing to take him, but they said, no, no, no. And I went, oh, really? I got two hours to myself. I didn't know what to do with it. I went, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I went, oh man, I can go work out. I can, uh, you know, I can go grocery stuff. I, I can go buy dress. You know, whatever, because the lighthouse picked him up and took him home. I wasn't worried about him, you know, and he loved going to the classes and learning stuff. So I like that. So, so, so I, it varies, it varies around, but the services offered through the state agencies are provided at no cost and most private agencies provide those at no cost right. as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't see any additional questions. I have one of my own, which would be um, for Curtis and Shayla. 
how did the two of you um, maintain your own sanity in the beginning when um, Cheryl and John needed more from you when they began to lose vision? How, what did you do to take care of yourselves? Good question. Well, Curtis is different than mine because he lived with us a lot longer than I did. This was a second marriage for both John and I. So that was the last thing I expected to happen to him. So, you know, for me, it was all about figuring out how to help him, what to do. Uh, I mean, Curtis lived with it for a long time with, Ta with Cheryl. So it was different. This all happened so quickly with us that, you know, he, and he was so angry. And then I get angry because he was angry. And then I'd feel bad because I got angry at him because I felt so sorry for him. And, you know, and then he felt sorry because, you know, all of a sudden my life was taken from what he thought we were going to have the same you know, so, but you get, you have to have a sense of humor. I'm telling you, you have to have a sense of humor. You get over the small things and go on with the next things. Let's just, okay, that's done. Let's go on. And you, then you, you figure out a way, like uh, Curtis said, you can't do it one way. You figure out another way to do it. And that's what we did. So. And I think Shayla, the other day you mentioned that you do have activities that you do on your own now. Yes. Which is, I go off with the girls, which he doesn't go off with the girls. You know, he's too flirty. I tell him he'll be checking out the girl's <laughs> legs. And so he's not going with me when the girls. So, you know, so I do that on Fridays. I go off by myself with the gals. And um, so I do that. And then I have sisters. I'm very blessed that I have three sisters that live around me and my daughter. So, and John's quite capable of staying here by himself until he fell, end up in the hospital yesterday. But outside of that, he's quite capable of staying here by himself for a couple hours so I can go. And like I think it was Curtis, I think it was sure one of you guys said that yesterday or last week that you do need time away mm -hmm. from the loved one, you know, so so I can talk about something else, you know, hey, boy, look at that baby over there. He's got a cute little butt. Well, like my husband wants to hear that. He didn't care about the little baby waddling around in this cute little outfit, you know, stuff like that. Crazy things, you know, so but yeah, it takes time, you know. And you do have to have time for yourself. And you're right about that. And that was one of the hardest things that John and I had to come to deal with because I was smothering him. I wasn't, I was doing everything for him because I felt so bad. So then, then I was upset, you know, because now my whole life, all I'm doing is, you know, here, let me get you this. Oh, let me get you this. You can't do that until he, I realized he could do these things. You know, and he and he did, you know, and he quit being so darn angry all the time. So that made me a happy camper because I wasn't angry. So it goes around and helps. It's a big you got to have a support system. Simple as that, you know, and ours was a lighthouse and the VA. They were great, you know, and everybody's different. I know. But like I said, we didn't we didn't have time to learn it. It just happened so quick with us. So adjusting was quite different. There are a lot of people just like us, only even worse. So, and we're survived and we still love each other. And hey, he still picks on me. I still tell him when I've got a cute outfit on. I said, What do you think about this, honey? And he'll say, Hey, we'll turn sideways. Let me see it. You know, so. <laughs> Tammy yeah. or Curtis, do you all have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, it's a little different for me, I think, because um, as I mentioned, we have two 95 year old moms living with us. And both of them at this point really can't be left alone. Um, not be, not, it's not because of my mom's blindness, more because of the dementia combined with the blindness. So it just makes her at more risk of falling and um, other things. So, so that's been difficult. Um, my mother-in-law, she, she also had some falls. So we, we don't feel like we can leave the house, you know? So it's, it is very stressful, especially with COVID, making it difficult to get out. Um, but what we did do, which has been helpful, is hire uh, a home health aide that comes once a week so that my husband and I can have a date day. <laughs> and I think that's very helpful um, just to, as, as Shayla said, to have some time to yourself where you're not thinking necessarily about the family situation. You're just kind of getting away. John, did you have anything? 
Curtis. Curtis. Or Curtis. I'm so sorry. Oh, I, <laughs> John's in the hospital. Him. Broken ribs. <laughs> yeah, and, and Shayla, I just not sure I speak for you when, when we wish him the best. Hope he gets out of there soon. So um, um, we're hoping he gets out today. So we'll see. Good. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of it's been covered, I think, and what the other two have said. Um, certainly, uh, Cheryl and I have always kind of taken this view that, um, you know, everybody has some kind of burden in this world. Um, God has blessed us throughout our lives, no doubt. Um, and so you know, there's, there's people that we know that are part of our lives that have problems that are not... Um, they're not able to overcome them. And some of them are medical and some of them are fatal. And fortunately, vision impairment is not that, right? Um, so I, I think it's important that you focus on moving forward, that you focus on engaging in as much of a normal um, life and go for the adventure and the goals that you've always had set for yourself. And again, just find a different way to, to go after them. And you'll see things along the way, like taking a detour on a trip. That you don't see when you're on the interstate, and that's a beautiful view sometimes. Hmm. That's so good. We have uh, a couple. Uh, here's a two-part question because it's two questions that are kind of related. Did any of you take advantage of family counseling about the vision loss? And along with that, what is one piece of advice that you would give a family member who is just beginning the grieving process with a loved one? Who wants to take that first? <laughs> Well, we did not do any family counseling. I can say that. I think that um, John was not ready to do that. And that's not something you can force him to do. Uh, I think that it would have helped. I really do. Um, but he wasn't willing to do that. I told you how it took me to get even to go to the lighthouse. But um, we did not do that. And I think that would have helped. So I don't know since we didn't do it. I don't know. If, did you do that, Cheryl? Did you guys do any family I, counseling? Really, really good question. Um, my first job at Alpha Point was as intake coordinator. I answered the phone, all the people calling in who were lost and scared and angry and, and crying and lost their job or, you know, there's just a whole multitude of things that happen. And the first thing they would say is, and I'd say, absolutely, we're going to get you signed up for counseling. And in the meantime, let's have you um, hear about low vision rehabilitation. And one of the things that we have found is when you give someone back their independence to make a pot of coffee, turn on the microwave, use a telephone, order transportation services, when you give them back that independence, the need for counseling in many cases, not all cases, diminishes. You still I need agree. Okay, but when you give them back their independence, they become independent and happy again and, and feel like, okay, whew, I can make my own pot of coffee, you know, and they're not frustrated and angry like you said, Shayla. So mm -hmm. um, that's from my viewpoint. Curtis, do you, what do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, uh, I think that just focusing on a plan um, in that stage will help a lot. Um, certainly, I, I don't think that um, uh, counseling is in any, in any way be uh, anything but good for most people, um, even if it's just to confirm what your thinking is at that point and help you get through that stage. But, I, you know, I, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist by any means, but I would say that for me, not focusing and dwelling on that for too long, certainly we have periods of time where we sit down and talk about uh, the challenge and we talk about, um, you know, the problems in front of us, but my, my attitude in life has always been that, okay, this is what I've got. So I got to make a plan. What's the plan. And that's where these kind of services have helped us immensely and, and, uh, get going. So and counseling is certainly a, a, an important component for the plan. Do you want to add anything, Tammy? Um, well, we, we never did do any counseling. I, mean, I am pro counseling for anyone who is willing to do it, but you, you kind of, you do have to have the willing participants. So as Shayla mentioned, if, if your loved one isn't, isn't ready, then that might be difficult. I think though, is there, if there's any way to get the 
loved one engaged in a group of folks like at the lighthouse if even if it's virtual you know try to find one of those groups where you can just connect with others that have gone through it or are going through it can be like a counseling you know it's it's just nice to have peers that can um, relate to you and give you advice and you know I don't know if this is possible maybe you guys know but is it possible for the the um, the caretaker to attend some of these sessions without their loved one if they if the loved one doesn't want to go because I would think there'd be lots of value there if I had done that early on I probably would have learned a lot of things that would have been helpful for me to help my mom. Um, and actually, then maybe I'm sorry, Tammy, to interrupt you, but actually the lighthouse did do that one time. They did mm -hmm. suggest that the spouses come in or whoever their caregiver was come in and be separate from the group. Mm -hmm. And they had questions and all that. So I did attend at that one time. And John wasn't involved on that. That was just me with a group of the other caregivers. And that was helpful to me because that's when I realized how much I was doing for John and not letting him do it himself because I was felt so sorry for him. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, I just felt so sorry for him all the time. But right. I, that did help. It did help me realize that I'm doing too much. He's got to be doing these things for himself now that I know he can do them. You know, now right. that I know it's possible, but I didn't know, you know, if you don't know when somebody's blind, what, what they're going through, I, I didn't know a blind person. So, yeah, I'm going to give you from the, from my perspective as a visually impaired person, Curtis and I went to a conference in St. Louis and it was for people with visual impairment, RP, to come together and, you know, talk and, and be together. And at one, and Curtis thought going into that, it was going to be all about me and getting me help. In the end, all the caregivers and loved ones, we looked over, at, pardon the pun, and they were all sitting in a corner around a table, just having a great time. And he walked away from that conference, um, having met other people who were caregivers and loved ones. And I was so happy because it was something for him to, you know, and he got to, he realized in talking to the others that what he was experiencing, they were experiencing too. So it's too. important from our perspective that our loved one has the support they need. Right. So we and have it, a couple, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to mention, you know, given the COVID situation and a lot of things are, are not allowing that face-to-face -face connections. You know, I'm just <laughs> gonna make a plug again for ACB and um, I think NFB also has these, these online groups with lots of different topics that you can engage in. And I would highly, highly recommend getting connected up during this COVID time to those groups because it allows you to converse with other people. I mean, it can even just be like, I don't know. I think there are there are things like just getting together and chatting and you know about the the latest news, you know, but it's just a way to connect and I think that's important. Well, and and that that directly relates to a question that we just got in about how important do you feel like support groups are and it sounds like Tammy you think they're pretty important which I would I'd have to agree we do have another question um, from Audrey and she asked um, Cheryl how did your your kids handle your vision loss how did they react and adjust I am so blessed we are so blessed you know Matthew's 29 and Shelby is 25 they have never known me to drive. Okay. They have, I was just like every other mom, only I couldn't see. And growing up, they played little tricks on me. You know, we, in our house, we laugh, we use humor, Sheila, as well. Uh, they say if they got mad at me, they just moved the furniture two inches. I'm like, all right, you two. Um, I just never let them use my vision loss as an excuse for anything. It, I was determined to lead by example. 
to never let them see me. It was okay to see me in weak points, weak moments, okay? But then how I recovered from that weak moment is what I wanted them to take away. And Curtis, you're gonna have to finish because I'm. we have good kids and I'm so proud of them because they, they didn't have a normal childhood in some respect because in the summertime when moms were taking their kids to the swimming pool, I couldn't. But I found a way for us to get to the pool, the neighborhood pool or the community pool. I just found different ways. And sometimes I felt really bad, but then I had to go, no, other families have bigger burdens or bigger issues than me taking my kids to the pool for crying out loud. <laughs> um, I think, I think Cheryl, that's such a valid point. Um, and this is Sylvia and I dropped off for a minute and got back on, but um, is that you have to be adaptable no matter what age, whether you're a parent as a blind parent or you're dealing with your spouse who's lost, losing their vision or lost their vision, or you're the child, is that adaptability is so key. Yeah. You really have to figure out what works for us and right. what works for you might not work for someone else. Mm -hmm. And the key is like Cheryl was saying is they figured out what worked for them. Right. And how we define how we define that success is about us, not about, oh, this person, they did this. And and you know, you know, every day it's just trying to do a little better. Right. So and that adaptability is key. I think today our kids are stronger for it. Um, when Curtis had cancer a few years ago, Matthew would leave college every Saturday morning, drive three hours, come home, mow the yard, take care of this, that, and the other. They both had a credit card to our bank account. Shelby did all the grocery shopping, the banking, and everything. And these kids were 17 and 19 years old, and they were helping me run the house. I never had to look twice, but they stepped That's up. Cool. And I really think it's because, you know, they... They had a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, we have a comment from Florida that she says, what an awesome mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Parents. Parents. Yeah. Yeah. But people, but but I will also say to add to that is that people live up to the expectations we set for them. And um, as as the loved ones of people who are visually impaired. Uh, allow your loved one to have higher expectations from you. You might be a little scared. You might be nervous. And I think all three of our, you know, all three, well, four of our guests have talked about that is that you might have to go out on a few limbs and, and let people do stuff that you're a little nervous about, but let them show you they can do it. Let's see, uh, we have one more question that just came in. Um, can you share about a person that's losing their vision and how the trust factor in allowing others to help is implemented? So you're, you're asking, I think, in regards to um, the person who is visually impaired trusting the other person. And I think Cheryl, you'll agree with me. It is really hard. It's really hard to accept help, to know that you need that help. And I think that's why being able to have as much independence and self-respect and dignity that you can get is so important as you're walking through that journey. And especially if you're losing vision, uh, Cheryl shared it so well is that the the continual losses mm -hmm. yeah they start small and they get bigger and bigger and bigger but you also have to be better and better and better about coping with them or you don't cope and we haven't talked about this today but many people are not coping and I think that's one of the major reasons we wanted to do this webinar today is that we know at least uh, you know, the majority of people 
are not seeking out training, are not seeking out ways to be more independent. Because number one, they don't know that they can be. Number two, they're scared. And number three, they don't have the the support system around them that encourages them to. And as a loved one, sometimes you got to push. Like Shayla, she drove him there and said, we need to check this out. And, you know, Curtis, who said, you know, I believe in you. You can do it. He didn't quit his job to stay home and take care of Cheryl. And Tammy, who found a way to help her mom keep on sewing. So it's about how do you promote that independence, but giving a little push to, because we need it. And Sylvia, we actually did get a question. Someone asked, how, Shayla, how did you find the lighthouse? How did you find out about it? I think we might have lost her. Oh, did we? Okay, sorry I about that. I think so. Okay. Um, if, if I remember, she found out some from friends in her neighborhood, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, Audrey tells us that this is a really important comment that she made. She says, as a visually impaired mom, I believe my kids have learned great life skills because of having mm -hmm. a VI mom. Lots of positives come can come out of this experience. And then we yeah. have... Another question that I think is really interesting that um, you guys may want to take turns um, answering is, what topics would you recommend be presented or discussed as part of support groups? I, I feel really strongly about support groups. They make a difference. Yeah. And they can be a telephone support group. They can be an internet-based support group. They can be an in-person support group. They might even be that you met somebody who you just have an interaction with. You call each other every week. That support is so important. So to me, topics, and, and I think um, others are going to, um, Audrey, I think, is going to have a lot to say here, probably Pris, too. That self-advocacy, I think, is really important. Um, dealing with your own emotions, if you're a loved one, really important. Um, coping strategies for a visually impaired person, coping strategies. How to, ha how to handle the fear and pushing your own self, that self-determination, really important. Audrey or Pris, do you guys have anything? Those life. are just two. If I could well, just, uh, if I could make a comment there. Um, mm -hmm. I watched Cheryl's father um, go from being pretty much out of contact with any other folks to being a pretty prominent member of several online chat groups um, of other folks who have RP. And I would say, as far as topics, I think it's good to have some targets. But what I've seen is that they just have coffee together in the morning and born out of those natural conversations are solutions to issues that they're having that another person's already solved with their same issue. So I think a lot of that's just getting together with people who have similar experiences and the conversation will take you to solutions is what, what I've witnessed. It has changed my father's life and made a huge, whenever I talk to him on the phone, he always, you know, Sherry out in North Carolina. Yes, yes. <laughs> I am Sherry's best friend. I've never met her. Um, so yes, what Curtis just said is hugely important. Um, me, I have a coworker that lives in North Carolina and we talk once a week. And just to touch base and on a professional level, you know, mm -hmm. what we're experiencing and sometimes on a personal level. Right. I think the key is the positive, like solution oriented part of it. And um, resources are also, you know, helping people know about resources is really important because I am always finding about out about new things just from talking to people um, who either are visually impaired themselves or who work in the field. And I've been around this field for 20 years and visually impaired my whole life. So resources is really important too. And to that um, topic, we have a resource list that we've put together for everyone mm -hmm. who attends this webinar. You can find that. I've put it in the chat a couple times, but I'll say the website as well. It is aphconnectcenter.org forward slash webinars. 
and then one more forward slash webinar dash documents. So if you just go to aphconnectcenter.org forward slash webinars, you can get to it uh, that way as well. It looks like we have another question. Let's see. Oh, well, Audrey's uh, comment is brilliant. Yes. And it's really about understanding. And so um, her comment was separating people and, you know, letting the, the group who's visually impaired and the, the loved ones talk about their feelings and understanding the feelings of the other. And I think so many times we heard people say, especially Curtis, communication, communication, communication. And none of us are mind readers. And so helping people understand. And I know that's hard for me to tell my husband, I am super frustrated because I can't see and my technology is not working. And, you know, that's hard, but being willing to do that sometimes is really important. And so that, that understanding, that attempt to understand each other's feelings. And Melanie, am I right that our time is getting close? Let's do a time check. We have a few more minutes left if we have okay. more questions. Um, yeah, it's up to you. Actually, folks, I have to go because I I, I got to go up to the hospital. So okay, um, Shayla, I, I've thank enjoyed you it. So much Shayla, and thank hugs you. To John. And good luck to all of you, folks. So you know, thank you. and Sylvia, my, my John, husband said John to send was a hug to you. One of my favorite clients ever. Just saying. <laughs> Tell him he'll get a he kick was a out tough of that cookie. He was a tough <laughs> cookie. <laughs> all right, thanks, guys. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye. 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 Chris has a comment. Do you want to? Yes. Speak up, Pris. Or no? <laughs> Maybe she's not able to. to I take just the had mic. a problem oh, getting myself go. unmuted. I was just saying um, several years ago, I ran an agency in Florida, and one of the, th the most popular things that we did was we had uh, a support group for family members and we had a support group for people with vision loss. And they would come to our center at the same time and just separate. And it really worked out so well mm -hmm. because it solved the transportation problem of people being able to get there <laughs> and people were able to interact. And then sometimes mm -hmm. we would have the, the groups come together and talk about the things that came up in each group. And then mm -hmm. they would do some problem solving together. So it really was a, I was so happy about that, that concept. Mm -hmm. And we did it for several years. It worked out well, really well. Yeah. People I, just want to talk about their feelings. They do and they need to. Um, is it possible if Audrey is interested in connecting with me outside of this to get exchange each other's information? Absolutely. We can get you guys connected for sure. Okay. Yeah. Can well, I we have a support group section on vision aware and Audrey's working on updating that too, right? Now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so all of that is included on our resource guide that we shared on the, the website I mentioned earlier. So be sure you guys to go grab that. There's a lot of good information, articles, courses, uh, websites, you name it, it's on there. So we tried to really pack it full of info for you guys. And information is what loved ones need. Um, so uh, for the professionals who are on the call today who are working with people, connect connect the loved ones to resources, mm -hmm. connect them to vision aware. Um, the, these are the information you, you can't provide all the information, connect them to places where they can find information, where they can connect to support groups and other resources. That's really important. You know, the loved one is truly the champion behind the person. Mm -hmm. not truly the champion. Absolutely. Are there any other questions from our audience? Do you guys have any last minute burning questions that you want to ask? We do still have a few more moments if we need them. I guess I, I am also curious to hear from you guys. What do you know now that you wish you had known then? You know, just mindset, I think, not really resources. You know, something that's... Um been going through my mind a lot i think melanie that's a great follow kind of summation question is um it, the word that keeps coming to my mind is community you know there's a community of people to help and it's 
sometimes people on your block. It can be people in your church. It can be people at one of the service agencies that we discussed here. But the more that you can involve yourself with other people, the more you're going to expand your horizons, as Sylvia was saying, about things that we're still learning today, right? There's just always something new and different coming up as well as um, you're going to have a support system for the caregiver as well. Um, you know, Cheryl could go to the pool. She could go to school functions and do things when I was out of town on business because we had this great community of people that we invested ourselves in. And I can tell you, Cheryl did as much for those moms as she did for them. Um, so it's important to build community and true valuable friendships and family relationships to help. That's, that's been huge. And that, yeah, well said. And, and can I just say to Curtis and Cheryl's point there is that vision loss doesn't make you a different person. It creates some challenges to who you are. And it, it certainly is a huge impact to your life, but you can still contribute. You can still be productive and you should still have your same friends and a lot of your same hobbies, but it doesn't make you a different person. And so you mentioned that Cheryl contributed just as much to the other moms as they contributed to her. And that's because she remained being her. Anybody else have any, what you wish you knew then that you know now? I wish I had known that people want to help you. And they, Mr. Rayburn over here had to kind of knock that in my head because I was afraid to ask for help. I was afraid to ask, you know, the mom, you know, if they would pick up our children and take them to school in the morning. Um, I was afraid to ask. And when I found out that people want to help me just as much as I want to help them, you know, I was always the organizer of, okay, this family over here has experienced a, a crisis in their household. Okay, who wants to bring dinner on Monday? Who wants to bring dinner on Tuesday? You know, I was that mom and that person in our community. And finally, Curtis said, Cheryl, they want to help you as much as you help them. You've got to let them in. And when I, that, when that, when I realized that, my whole world opened up. And I wish I had realized that sooner. I think for me, um, I've said this before, but it's that realization that there's so much more you can do to prepare. You know, as as the eyesight is diminishing, there's so much more you can do in the beginning stages, and that you know it's unfortunate. It's so unfortunate that the doctors and the people working with people who are new to vision loss are not educating them to um, be aware of that. You know, it's, it's not good enough to wait until you can't see. You really should start so much sooner if you have the, the um, knowledge that you have an eye condition. That's a really good point, Tammy. I spend a lot of time going around town talking to retinal specialists and ophthalmologists. And I share with them, please don't tell your patients or you don't have to tell your patients there's nothing more we can do for you. What right. you share with them is your next steps are, mm -hmm. and it be a place like Lighthouse or Alpha Point or an agency in their town where they go and learn how to do things that they want and need to do. They just learn how to do them different. And that mm -hmm. our doctors have been extremely receptive to that. That's awesome. That's wonderful, yeah. Yeah, another uh, resource that we did include on our resource list that I think is, is very valuable too is, um, well, two resources, um, the Older Individuals Who Are Blind Techni Technical Assistance uh, Center where Sylvia works has an excellent course um, called, Sylvia, Life Lessons, is that right? Um, and then also lessons for living. Lessons, lessons for, living. for living. Sorry, lessons I always mess living. that up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lessons for living, and it is included on our resource list, as well as um, here at APH Connect Center, our VisionWare website, we have uh, a getting started guide for people new to vision loss, and it just has some of the very practical tips that you can do to just get started. 
Um, and we have lots of webinars coming up about different topics that we've brought up here today. Um, we are going to have webinars about technology, about low vision exams, about getting in the kitchen and cooking with low vision, crafting with low vision, things that you may not have, have thought were possible still. Uh, so I really encourage you guys to take a look at all that. We do have a comment um, that the, some good advice to give ophthalmologists because it is noted that they also feel hopeless when there are decree when sorry when there are decreasing or no options for medical intervention. So that it sounds like the ophthalmologists even feel hopeless. So it's good that the ophthalmologists are getting information to give their patients. So it feels like they're failures sometimes and. You know, this gives them something to do. Yeah, absolutely. So as we get closer to time, I am going to go ahead and put the ACV REP code in the chat, and we will give the code at the very end. But I want you guys to know that it's there. Uh, any last questions from uh, any of the audience or any comments that you guys, panelists, would like to make? I wanted to say, you know, as the child of someone who is blind that I myself, you know, I, I know Cheryl and Curtis, you mentioned your kids. I myself feel stronger as the child of someone who's blind. And I've learned a lot from my mom. And I feel like I'm much more adaptable. I, um, you know, I, I watch her as she figures things out and she doesn't even know she's doing anything different, you know, but it just gives me so much encouragement on um, life in general that yeah you know th th we all have challenges but it's a lot about your attitude and about how you are willing to approach it so just wanted to give that out as a perspective of of a daughter that's great all right sylvia did you have anything else or i don't know is she still with us I'm still here. Oh, yep. Okay, good. <laughs> Did you want to well, say um, anything to wrap up? I think that so many really valid points have been brought out today and that the loved one makes such a vital difference. And just, you know, make sure that you know that everything you do really does make a difference and that there is hope. And you can, can really continue with independence and and um, just a positive life. It's hard, but there are lots of hard things. And this is just one of those and just being adaptable and communicating and being encouraging is really important. Thank you so much again to Curtis and Cheryl and to Tammy. Um, we already said bye to Shayla, but thank you guys so much. I think you represent so well the success that can be had when the family and the loved one really do support independence and self-advocacy and self-sufficiency. So thank you. From the team here at the Connect Center and Vision Aware also, I just want to thank you all. And Sylvia, thank you for a thank wonderful, you. we're getting comments and big thanks to the entire panel. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, oh gosh, they're all coming in. Thank you. Definitely success stories. Um, oh my goodness, lots of comments. <laughs> Thank you. You can't keep up with them. No, well, now it's starting APH. to scroll. Thanks to APH for doing this really important yeah. webinar. We are really passionate about getting the word out there and letting people know that there is hope, uh, that vision loss is not a death <laughs> sentence. And, nope. um, and you guys have really helped us to accomplish that today. 